In studio right now, a couple of familiar guests for us, the Secretary of State and candidate for Governor Mac Warner. Mac, good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you. And our buddy, Buzz Poland. Buzz, how are you doing? Good morning, Rob. Doing great. Good to see you again. Good to see you always. It's starting to round into Buzz Poland season around here. Parks and Rec is about to become very active again. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be here plugging some more memorial stuff pretty soon. Absolutely. And uh, in studio, Mac Warner with a plaque. What do you've got there, Mac? Well, we've got a Centurion Award to the give out today. Centurion Award. We do. All right, let's hear about it. Well, uh, the Centurion Award uh, is to recognize those companies that have been around a community for a long, long time. Uh, we're always so anxious to get out there and do a ribbon cutting and welcome a new business, and we do want new businesses to come to the state. But uh, the mainstays of our communities are those uh, people and businesses that have been around for a long time. And the Centurion Award, of course, playing off the Roman Centurion um, unit that uh, a Centurion would take care of about 100 men and, and train them and be responsible for them and make sure that they are battle ready and uh, so that they can last the, the test of time. And it was the Roman legions that uh, made Rome what it was uh, for hundreds of years. So we, we played on that name, and in the Secretary of State's office, we're, of course, responsible for the registering of businesses throughout the state. And um, we want to pay tribute to those businesses that have been here for 100 years. And uh, that's what uh, we're doing today uh, with the Union Sales Company. And uh, Buzz, of course, has been instrumental in that. And uh, so if we could, I'd, sure. I'd like to just go ahead and do the presentation here. And it's, this certificate is to recognize the Union Sales Company, founded in 1920 in Berkeley County, West Virginia, as a 2020 member of the West Virginia Centurion Chamber of Commerce. And so as I hand this to, to Buzz, what I'd like to do is just mention that, think of this, we're talking about back to World War I times and a company that is founded and registered and starts doing business and then goes through World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, the tumultuous 60s, uh, on through now 911 and up to today with COVID. And has lasted that that long, and that's what uh, it, these are the the people that have uh, brought us the jobs, paid their taxes, made things happen, provide goods and services throughout the community, and so it's just always a real honor for me to to not only present these awards but to meet the people behind the awards. And uh, so, Buzz, what I'd like to do is go ahead and make this presentation to you today, and congratulate you on a century of uh, doing the great things here in Berkeley County. Thank you, Mac. Um, I, I can give no better, greater credit than to, to all the many, many employees I was blessed to have over the years. And uh, you know, the family had some investment in the company and, and some foresight, but uh, it, it was some just absolutely fantastic, loyal employees that allowed me the opportunity and the time to get out and do other stuff in the community and so forth. Now, this was founded by your grandfather, correct, Buzz? Yes. Okay. Yep. My grandfather started actually as the Berkeley Garage in 1913 and incorporated in 1920 under the name Union Sales. So you sold, sold Dodge primarily? What, what it it originally you? started as a Ford dealership. And uh, I was explaining to Lexi the... the uh, uh, Dodge Brothers, John and Horace Dodge, were the key suppliers of all the mechanical components to Ford. And uh, when they couldn't quite work out a buy-sell agreement, the Dodge Brothers said, oh, to heck with it, we'll just start our own car company. And in 1914, uh, the first Dodge came off the line. My grandfather, being very familiar with their reputation, was quick to get a Dodge franchise in January 1915, and Union Sales was a union of several different brands, uh, along with the Maxwell and the Pullman and several other brands that, that uh, uh, most folks don't remember anymore. Uh, but uh, that, that, that's where the name the Union came from and uh, Moved ahead primarily with Dodge and Plymouth for, and Grand Brother Trucks, which became Dodge Trucks, uh, made up the bulk of the business for, for many, many decades. And uh, I, I think there would be a fourth generation of the family operating it today had it not been for the uh, 
uh, opinion and, and, and ruling of the Troubled Asset Relief Program that insisted that uh, 25 percent of, of the dealers be terminated if, if they were going to take bailout money in 2009. Let me drift back before we go, and I think I've been an interesting uh, subject to talk about as well. The uh, uh, how you were squeezed out, but there was an automobile that was that was made and manufactured in Martinsburg, Norwalk. Uh, Norwalk, yeah. Uh, was that were their cars sold with Union sales? No, no. They, their manufacturing facility was moved to Martinsburg. Uh, the car already existed. Moved here and. It was about a five-year period, I believe, Norwalk was manufactured in Martinsburg. And there's still a few of those cars around today. V very few. Yeah. Norwalk very few. Car Club features. Yes, uh, Norwalk yeah. Car yeah. Club yeah. bought one. Uh, yeah. One of, I, at that time, I think I'd heard there was only three mm -hmm. known to yeah. be left. Yep. And they purchased it from a family out in Colorado, I believe. Yeah. Mac, so that answered the trivia question in the discussion I had with you before we went on the air as to how that filtered down that Buzz would have to close the uh, dealership, the old TARP program, right? Well, and, and I think that brings home a point that I, I'm making during my campaign for governor, and that is that government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. Look what that's done to somebody who's been around, the, the business that's been around for 100 years providing goods and services to the people. And then the government comes in with a program and basically says you have to do away with 25%. And so uh, it, whether it's in the energy, uh, health care, wherever, the government just isn't the best decision maker on who should win and lose or stay alive in, a, in the business world. We're going to leave that up to the market. We're a capitalist uh, d uh, democratic republic. And we ought to leave it up to the market to decide winners and losers, not have government uh, making these decisions, which uh, can hurt a, a person and a community. Well, you, you close down a local dealership. You close down jobs for people. Buzz was a, a great local businessman. He, he sponsored Little League teams and uh, whatever charitable things that needed to come about and th those sorts of things that uh, maybe – uh, the TARP program, when they drew it up, they had some good intentions or whatever, but it filters down to a small town, a local community, and that creates a hole, uh, something that used to be there and was dependent and relied upon. And at the time, Buzz had one of the more robust automobile businesses in the, in the county, in the area. So. Absolutely. West Virginia, unfortunately, was percentage-wise the hardest hit state in the country when it came to uh, per capita the number of dealerships that were required to to Close. be terminated. Yeah. Dealerships and in general had to be terminated? I don't understand where the 25% comes from. The, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, when they finally got around after months and months of him and Hall and whether they wanted to save, uh, attempt to save the domestic car industry, uh, Ford, Chrysler, Dodge, uh, General Motors, uh, all were desperately needing funds. And the Troubled Asset Relief Program said that, okay, we've been bailing out the major banks and AIG insurance and what have you, but uh, we don't know whether we want to do this or not. So they hemmed and hauled around a while about it after they decided they did want to save it because of all the sub-supplier companies that made all these parts that the manufacturers were really just assembling. They, um, at the top of the list of, of several conditions was, if you accept the bailout money, Mr. Car Manufacturer, you must agree to eliminate 25% of your dealerships, which for just Chrysler Corporation with Dodge, Jeep, and Chrysler cars, was just south of 3,200 dealers. You put eliminated. That, hmm. You put that in the com calculator. 25 percent of Union Sales Company was just one of 789 either Chrysler, Dodge, or Jeep dealership franchises that were terminated. Wow. And this was happening all over the country. And the state of West Virginia was the hardest hit. And that was all out of the banking crisis of 2008 and 9, I think, if I remember that correctly, Buzz, correct? Yeah. Right? It started with the, 
Well, I mean, there's all kind of pieces of the puzzle, but gas prices had hit over $4 a gallon in our area. Lord knows what they were in California. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the financial meltdown there in September of uh, 08 really uh, brought things to light. And then uh, wasn't till winter that they decided this TARP commission decided to try to do something to help the car in the domestic car industry, not just walk away from or let it fail. Uh, but never made sense to anybody I've ever talked to in 15 years now as to what they thought was going to be accomplished by that. Mac, let me and, ask you a question here. Let me one more thing. Yeah. Ford, when when faced with those orders, Ford, as desperate as they were for money, absolutely refused. We said, we, we, we will not accept those conditions. And I'm sure it was one heck of a gamble and a risk for them to go forward without any bailout money when two of their com- major domestic competitors were taking the money, but they refused to do that said the dealers are our customers that's who buy our product and and have we'll go back to mac here so mac what can a governor do when the federal government says here's what's going to happen if you take money from us here are the rules and those rules are going to cost jobs in your state what can a governor do about that well that's the exact problem there's no such thing as a free lunch this stuff sounds good it's politically politically expedient at the time uh, sounds good, bailout money, that sort of thing. But then look what it does to a local uh, business. And uh, we're seeing it right now with the, uh, they call it the Inflation Reduction Act. It's the Inflation Causation Act. We're all paying for that right now, okay? These are the sorts of things that need to be taken to the people. The vaccines, it, it, people should be left with choices. These shouldn't be government-mandated things. This should be left to the people's uh, decisions. Like I said before, these things may sound good at the moment, but over time we see that, you know, there's a lot of uh, un uh, expected consequences of some of these actions. And so what a governor can do is he can fight back, he can push back. Look what Glenn Youngkin has done in Virginia with pushing him back against the uh, education where the government was going to do CRT or whatever, uh, drag queen shows, that sort of thing. No, parents have a right to be involved in the process. And when you have a governor that speaks up and fights for it, or DeSantis in Florida or Abbott in Texas pushing back against the illegal, illegal immigration, I plan to join those conservative governors that starts to take this country back one state at a time. Push back against this wokeness. We here in West Virginia, we know what a woman is, okay? And we don't want men playing on women's sports. Those types of things that a governor can uh, enforce, he can encourage the legislature to pass legislation. I don't want maiming of 10-year-old kids and having them decide what their sex is. And so uh, a governor can advocate for that, push back against D.C.'s woke policies, and uh, that's what we can do. Bill? Well, you made you can't lay out your uh, campaign platform pretty clearly there, and uh, there will be a lot of people to resonate with that. But there's going to be a lot of people that have problems with what they see is being done in Texas and Florida and the like. Uh, West Virginia is a red state, so perhaps your position will play very, very well. But there's going to be a, uh, you you very clearly just now laid out your platform. Exactly. Well, mm. uh, if you don't agree with that, then uh, somebody else is your candidate. Yeah. But if you're a yeah. family values uh, person who believes in the Constitution and the rule of law, that, see, I was just invited to Congress this last week to testify. I was the only Secretary of State in the mm. whole United States. They recognized that West Virginia is doing something right, and they wanted to hear what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, so we can explain best practices to other states. And, and that's what I did as Secretary of State. That's what I'll do as governor. Let me pick up on that, Mac. You have done a phenomenal job as Secretary of State. Uh, you're well recognized as being the leader ensuring that we run fair, honest elections. Congress has recognized that with asking you to appear last week. I would have anticipated that would be what you were running on your performance as Secretary of State, and to left it there. But you, you're choosing to take it one step beyond that. I am. Um, I, I'm really incensed about this. And people said, hey, you sound angry. Why well, I am angry. What the federal government did with its agencies 
in denying the uh, Hunter Biden laptop. They said that it was a, a fraud, a, a Russian hoax, when in reality they had planted that. Our own Secretary of State right now, Tony Blinken, was in the Biden campaign, and he went to the CIA assistant director and said, I need a letter that shows this was a Russian disinformation campaign. So they set this thing up, and sure enough, Morrell got 51 so-called intelligence experts to say that the Hunter Biden laptop was a Russian disinformation campaign. They knew that was a lie. And so CIA, NSA, DNI, these are our three letter agencies that are designed to protect us, and it's all under the watchful eye of the FBI. The FBI had this uh, laptop for over a year. They knew it was legitimate, and they allowed this to happen. This was a disinformation campaign against the people of the United States of America to throw an election, and they did. That election was stolen. I can now firmly state that there, there have been independent polls that have said, had the people of the United States known, the people that voted for Biden known about the Hunter Biden laptop, top 4.6 percent would not have voted for him and that would have been enough to throw the to turn the election so what they accused trump of doing was exactly what they did to the american people yeah i'm really hot about this and so that's what i t took to congress and we're seeing ha had there not been the republicans elected to the house in the in this last election we would have never known about this so that's the importance of elections we've got to get to the bottom of it and that's my message to everybody we need to look at what happened in that 2020 election and not ignore it, not just say, well, there weren't enough votes to overturn the election. Folks, there were. There were votes cast outside the law. So I'm back to the Constitution. Votes cast outside the law were in Pennsylvania, just to the north of us, accepting ballots three days after the election was over, when the state law says they have to be in by the close of the polls. So those are votes outside the law. In Michigan, accepting ballots without signatures and addresses, those are votes outside the law. They shouldn't have been counted. But uh, ballots dropped in drop boxes in Georgia and Wisconsin outside the law. There were enough votes outside the law to have overcome this election. That election was thrown. It was stolen. And we should not rest easy because if we don't, it's going to continue in the future. Zuckerbucks is another problem. This is another situation where uh, private uh, money is coming in or Google al algorithms that push the positive things for the Democrats at the top of the search engines rather than uh, the Republicans. All these things go into a thrown election. It wasn't fair. You know, I'm charged with doing free, fair, honest elections. We've done it here in West Virginia. We need to do that throughout the United States, and we can't rest easy until we do. Why aren't you running for state uh, for U.S. Senate then? Because there's so much work to be done here in the government in, in West Virginia. You can do so much as a governor. In the Senate, look at Joe Manchin. He's frustrated. You're one of 100, and it takes so long to get things done. As governor, you can actually get things done. We have to sure up our base right here in West Virginia, uh, and that's what I intend to do. John. Along the lines of <clears throat> free and fair elections in the journal this morning, the, uh, on the front page, there's a uh, Associated Press article under the headline, GOP election officials walking fine line on fraud and integrity. <clears throat> and in here, they um, they... They mention you as withdrawing your state last month from the Electro Re Electronic Registration Information Center, a bipartisan multi-state effort to ensure accurate voter lists. Um, it, it's got kind of a negative spin on sure. on their presentation here. I thought you might like to respond to that. Sure, that's the liberal press. Of course, well, they've got yeah. a negative spin on that, where that is a badge of honor. You know? when, you, when you're getting hammered by... Uh, you know, the liberal press, then you've done the right thing. Folks, we pulled out of ERIC, that's the Electronic Registration Information System, because we worked for eight months trying to correct that, and they had promised that they would take it up the agenda, get rid of this very partisan ex officio member on their board, and he refused to resign. They refused to kick, kick him off. They played politics with us, and it just showed their partisan nature. There's two parts that they like to emphasize, the clean voter lists, and yes, it was helpful to clean voter lists. What they didn't emphasize was the EBU, that's eligible but unregistered. And that's what they were designing to do, was to get all these people who had already had a chance to register um, at the DMV or through the county clerk and so forth. But what the contract required you to do is send out, it's like the government knows best. We're going to not make you, but we're going to encur strongly encourage you to register to vote by continuing to send you these, these postcards. And that was a requirement to then get the information for the um, to, to clean up the voter lists. Well, folks, we need, since 1993, there has been a requirement to clean your voter lists already. That's the NVRA, the National Voter Registration Act, requires you to clean up the list, but there's no enforcement mechanism to do so. And so it took to 19, or 2016, when I got elected, to have a Secretary of State says, we're gonna clean up the list. And since I've been in office, working with the county clerks, we've taken off over 400,000 names 
That's 400,000 opportunities for fraud to exist right here in this little state of West Virginia. We have less than 1.2 million registered voters. So that's a third, a fourth. And, and it took somebody to come in to work with the county clerks to do that. And so it's a matter of will. And if you don't have the will, then um, you got a problem. And so what Eric did, they did not have the will to clean up their own house. And when it got too partisan, I joined with Florida and Missouri, and we all pulled out at the same time. That sent a shot across the bow saying, you got a problem. We're going to find other ways to clean up those voter registration lists. I'm curious, did AP approach you for a comment on this, the story? They did. They, they okay. Yeah. All right. The 400,000, that's a big number. Were they fraudulent names or were they people who had died? And it's, it, it's died. It's convicted felons. It's duplicates. It's people who's moved. It's a whole uh, a range, a, array of people. And uh, it just needed some attention paid to it to clean it up. There were actually, and, and there are some right now, states that are being sued uh, because they have more registered voters than they do people living in the state. Uh, you know, they're, they're real, and we had four counties. When I came into office, we had four counties that were in that situation. And I didn't want to be sued. Of course, I wanted to clean it up anyway. So I started working with the clerks. They wanted it cleaned up. There's nothing good that comes from a bloated voter roll. It just, it causes more as you're looking through the poll books, it gets thicker and thicker, and there's these opportunities for fraud. People, my own cousin in Parkersburg, went to the polls and they said, I'm sorry, you've already voted. He said, no, I haven't. They said, yeah, yeah, it's marked here. Who's voting for these people? This is a, a rather common story. And what it is, is people are going into those voter registration lists, get names and casting ballots and uh, it's not widespread here in West Virginia, but it does happen. We just had a conviction last week in Mingo County for some uh, election fraud. So don't uh, buy into this. There's no election fraud. There is. But there was a big push starting back uh, uh, in the late uh, last century and then uh, early part of this century uh, to do just that. I know Secretary of State's ran on this. Secretary of State were very proud of their accomplishment. Uh, what you're saying is, even though there was a lot of awareness, they had been unsuccessful in purging these these voters' lists until you were able to do it. Is that correct? I, I kind of push back against the word purge. We simply okay. clean the list yeah, of that's people. That's a better word. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not people. It's names. These are names that are on the list. If, if somebody's died, that's no longer a person. That's a deceased that's right, individual. Yeah. So it's, their name needs to come off that list. If they're already, if they're a convicted felon, they shouldn't be on that list to begin. You know, as soon as they, they get to that conviction, until they've done their time and gone through parole, then they can come back onto the list. But while they're the convicted felon, they need to come off yeah. that list. Mac, polls show you're trailing Patrick Morrissey in this race for governor. <laughs> so uh, I presume the first thing you'll do is tell me don't pay attention to polls right now. No, I'm saying who paid for that poll? Uh, well, uh, I think it was Patrick, a Patrick, Patrick Morrissey okay, poll. If right? I paid for one, I'll bet you my poll might show something. Will different. you be paying for a poll in the near future? The poll comes next May 14th when people vote. All right. So uh, oh, a year from now. OK, but there's a long time between now and then. But in fairness, that poll was conducted by sponsors or at least sponsored by backers of Marcy as well. So there's some challenge at the legitimacy of that particular poll. Exactly. Absolutely. So size up this field right now. Why should you be the next governor? I'm the best man for the job. I'm best qualified. I'm a battle tested. And that's literally, OK, five years in Afghanistan. I've taken the shots and we've uh, lived through some very devastating times there in Afghanistan. So I'm mean, used to. Uh, calamity to uh, you know in the state you're talking floods you're talking a coal mine disaster you're talking those kinds of things and somebody has to have a cool head go through the process of you know notifying next of kin of dealing with the press of getting the recovery system you know all that sort of thing I've a 23 year army veteran I can deal with the National Guard and I understand the ranks I understand what their capabilities are uh, where, what they should and shouldn't do and so forth. So, And you see, we continually call on the National Guard. You name me one other person in this uh, gubernatorial race that has anything close to the experience I have uh, running the National Guard. I've been trained by the best schools in America with regards to leadership. Okay, and I'm talking uh, United States Military Academy at West Point. I've been on the art staff at the Army War College. I'm used to running large organizations. I had the largest rule of law program in the entire world. That's what I was in charge of in Afghanistan. I worked with the Supreme Court. Ministry of Justice, the Attorney General's Office, and the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Those were the ones I was responsible for in Afghanistan to set up a rule of law program. I was working with over 100 attorneys and interpreters in uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. And so I'm used to the mythology that you go about tackling tough, tough problems. When America has a tough problem to solve, they call in the United States Army. And that's how I've been trained. And so I bring that expertise into the governor's office. And now I've had six, seven years of 
Secretary of State duty. I've been working inside the Capitol office or Capitol complex right across the hall from the governor. I understand what takes place inside that office. I understand working with the House and the Senate. I will not be fighting with the House and Senate. I see those as allies, and I will be working with them to accomplish things for the people of West Virginia. So there's nobody else that, that comes close to those kind of qualifications. This isn't going to be on-the-job training for Mac Warner. This is going to be day one. Mac Warner is going to go in, take control of that state government, and work to clean up and make things much more efficient in that office, just as I have done in the Secretary of State's office. And I can go through the list of accomplishments in the Secretary of State's office, but I think people understand what I've done, and I'll do the same for state government as governor. And your final thought for Buzz Poland, your latest award winner. You asking me? Yes, sir. Well, what I, being a, a student, uh, basically back to, uh, I studied some Roman law. A, a lot of our legal foundation comes from the Roman law system. In fact, there are four pillars to Western civilization, starting with uh, Judeo-Christian monotheism, uh, then Greek philosophy, and then Roman law is, is the third pillar, and then Christian love is the fourth. But the um, uh, Roman law, uh, one of the things that really stood out to me was the word milestone. We all throw that around, but that comes from the Roman times, and what that was was one mile outside town they actually put a stone on the Appian Way on those all roads lead to Rome on those roadways and they put a, a stone up and when you crossed that stone there was actually people would hesitate before they stepped over because when you do you left the jurisdiction of the Roman city um, and, and you went into the military law that's what the importance of a milestone was the jurisdiction things changed the who was responsible who was who wrote the rules uh, you had the praetorian guard and uh, the praetorian system where once they announced a uh, decision that was that rule for that year and it was unchangeable that's why john the baptist's head was handed on a, on a platter because the king had promised anything that uh, his daughter wanted and that's what she said and so what, he didn't want to do that but that's what the law was at the time that's the sort of severity that you had with that system well back to this when you stepped across that uh, the milestone things change and that's what this represents a hundred years in business that's a milestone it's worth stopping and hesitating saying whoa something special is going on here and uh, the person that has lasted in the business that has lasted that long is owed our respect and that's one of the things the small business administration week that's what we're celebrating this week uh, is designed to do is to single out those people that have stood the test of time that have provided those goods and services and that we all ought to, you know, this week, pay tribute to these folks uh, because they are the mainstay of our communities. Two-thirds of the jobs in the United States come from people running small businesses like Buzz here. Uh, we all should be, if you're going to a small business this week, you should be thanking them for doing what they do. And, uh, again, for somebody like Buzz to uh, make it 100 years, I think it's noteworthy. It's a milestone that we all should be proud of. I'm proud of what you've done, and thank you for Thank you. Done. And you you are a mainstay here in this community, all the things you've done and continue to do. Buzz, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Congratulations to you. I'm sure that's a bittersweet uh, black to you, but nevertheless, nice to be recognized, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.